in our beautiful building in The Hague. As you said, I had a small eye operation and the eye needs some time to heal. So, you know, I can't be there. But uh, fortunately, we have been able to practice hybrid workshops meetings during the last couple of years. So this might work as a fine alternative. Thank you, Bas and Jan and Timo and others for organizing this uh, symposium on integrated assessment in a post-truth society, as you call it. From our perspective as PBL, working in the center of the science policy interface, this is a spot on theme. And I think I can really say that Norge's introduction really was very adequate, also in the context in which we operate. And I think we are making the move or several moves which are in line with your plea for a much more public oriented uh, knowledge culture in which it's not so much a discussion of facts and non-facts, but we are very much discussing the way in which, which facts are produced as public facts. So this is much more about a wider public debate or a public discourse, and the fact that there is some democratization taking place in that discourse. So, so I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to pick up uh, these issues with you. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, um, Bas already explained a bit about PBL. But let me just uh, uh, stress a few issues here. Yes, we're the Dutch National Institute for Strategic Policy Analysis in the fields of the environment, nature and spatial planning. We are there to contribute to the quality of political administrative considerations by conducting a surveys, analysis, evaluations. And we take on an integrated approach as much as possible. So, so we link the various dimensions of the uh, lived environment. We are first and foremost policy oriented. So we do our work to enlighten policy making. We do both solicited and unsolicited research. And the, the very um, strange paradox is that although we are part of the policy making machine, machinery in The Hague, we have a strict independent position. And that independence is guarded by ministerial rule. So we like to see ourselves as working at the forefront of knowledge development, but at the same time active in the kitchen of policy making. So we're really in the center of the, of the science policy interface. And we get confronted a lot with the contentious knowledge culture, which is at stake today. And I like to give you some impressions of how we deal with that. Next slide, please. What does our work consist of in broad strokes? Because there is much more and our knowledge practice is quite diverse and has been diversifying over the last couple of years. But from the, for the sake of the occasion, looking at it from the perspective of our data and integrated assessment work, this is what we do. We don't manage data systems on our own. The data are produced by others. But we buy data and turn them into indicator systems and then use them for all kinds of data systems, publicly available data systems. And we use them to produce assessments and integrated analysis, not only quantitative, but also qualitative analysis. And the thing we like to do most is to produce outlook studies. So looking for next level issues, next level challenges. What is climate change confronting us with within the years to come? What kind of policies could be able to meet those challenges? That's the kind of work we like to do. And we produce that work in terms of publications, but also in terms of events. We have a lot of knowledge at the table of policy making. So, so that is a very, a very diverse trajectory which our knowledge takes in relation to our political environment. The next slide, please. In organizing our uh, working program in 2016, we have identified four major clusters of challenges in which our knowledge should be related to. Climate and energy, adaptation and mitigation taken together, food, agriculture and nature, which is very much about biodiversity, but also about uh, the nitrogen uh, uh, balance, Green and circular economy, which is about resources and resource policies. 
and resilient city regions, which is very much about spatial developments and spatial uh, comprehension. Now, this, this sounds very sort of analytical when we differentiate between these four clusters of developments. But behind each cluster, there are some transitional challenges uh, being hidden. And their impact is enormous. I mean, if you really want to get down to climate neutrality by 2050, we really have to decarbonize the, old, the entire industrial revolution. And that's really fundamental. That will be touching upon the way we dress, the way we food ourselves, or the way we house ourselves, our own mobility, etc., etc. This is just to stress that the issues with which we deal are not strangely abstract, neutral, or analytical. They really touch upon people's interests. They really touch upon their well-being, they touch upon their routines, their culture, etc., etc. So these issues are impactful. And I think we have to take that into account when thinking through something like a post-truth society. When people start to discuss our knowledge claims, this is not just about our knowledge claims. It's also very much about the effects these knowledge claims will have to have through policy making on their entire life, their culture, their landscape, their routines. So this is not just a, a knowledge issue, it's very much also a wider existence issue, which we're dealing with, of, of which knowledge is a part. Next slide, please. So these transitional challenges have to be faced within a society which is changing by itself. And we better make sure to understand what we mean by a post-truth society. How small or wide is that notion? What have to we, do we have to take into account? Well, I have to, uh, on, on this slide, I have pictured three of the uh, 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 factors which we have to integrate in, taking, in thinking through what a post-truth society would mean. The first usual suspect is, of course, the ongoing fragmentation of politics, together with a diversifying society, also spatially. This makes it more and more complex to come to collective agendas or to collective knowledge cultures. And on the other hand, this also stimulates an ongoing search for differences, because that is what politics and politicians are made for to enlarge differences. So there is within this fragmentation of politics a dynamics, which is diversifying, diversifying also knowledge claims. This is a, a, a something which is, goes together with this political fragmentation as a dynamic. But behind that fragmentation of politics, and perhaps more fundamentally, is the increasing intermingling of cultures, cultural spheres of life which before were more clearly demarcated. I'm talking here, I'm thinking here of the spheres of politics, the media and science. These spheres have changed in themselves with bottom-up dynamics interfering much more with top-down tendencies. But at the same time, as a part of this, the spheres themselves have started to intermingle in unpredictable, complicated ways together with the norms and values related. This, I think, touches upon Norge's uh, idea of knowledge cultures becoming much more diversified. And with the media and politics and science and the norms related, much more interfering with one another. So what is a fact and what is not a fact is also influenced by the context in which that fact is produced and disputed. And there is no clear way in which we can, in a neutral way, demarcate, be demarcate between the one and the other. This is amongst many other things where hyper-communication and hyper-politics comes from. With the related stress on short-term instant conclusions and positioning strategies the lack of space for reflection, the turnkey standpoint. 
And third, last but not least, there is the impactfulness of the transitional agendas concerned. We better be aware of the fact that what is happening here is not just a distrust in science as such, but a distrust in policies which are seriously affecting people's lives and interests, at least in the short run, going along with a distrust in the science which is backing up and legitimizing those policies. Striking is, of course, the fact that those criticizing the science are mostly also on the lookout for alternative facts, therewith at least superficially following the basic rules of rational reasoning. The next slide, please. In this context, of course, also PBL has had its share of contested experiences. I'm not going into the details of the various cases that would take too long, but just sketching here some overall characteristics. I have disentangled at least four categories. There is distrust of modeling work. There is a misuse of findings, putting findings in a different context and starting to handle them in legitimizing other knowledge claims. There is the questioning of our independent position as PBL, a scientific institute, or criticizing our wording or appreciation of conclusions. This is very much stressing a Norge's point of a contestation taking place on multiple fronts. So the contestation is not just taking place on one front, it's a multiple discussion which is taking place and we have to be aware of that multiplicity. Now, interesting here is, of course, the first one, the distrust of models, because especially in this context of the workshop on integrated assessment. Distrust in modeling work has various faces. Distrusting the modeling dynamics themselves, because people just can't understand where the conclusions are drawn from. Distrusting the statistical reasoning behind it, focusing on the discre discrepancy between generic findings on the one hand and a specific case on the other, and distrusting the underlying assumptions on which models are based. Sometimes we see here a mixing up of the modeling work itself and the way in which the models are put into practice. When in politics, models are not used as models, as generic outlooks for possible futures, thus informing the political debate, but sometimes they are also used, or mostly they are also used as predictive forecasts, commanding and thus limiting political debate. Models as part of a technocratic approach to policy making. To me, that's not the problem of the models itself, it's a problem of the way in which the models are put into practice. So we should not only see this from the outside in as something which has only to do with the way science works, but also from the inside out as something which has to, has to do with the way in which modeling work is picked up in politics and used or misused in informing or disciplining politics. Some of the critique of modeling work has to do with the latter, not with the first. And to me, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between the one and the other. There is room here for a different way of handling models and informing politics, in better balancing the relationship between the relationalization of politics on the one hand and the politization of knowledge on the other, which indeed is asking for a much stronger relational approach. On the right bottom, you see a caricature made by a Dutch newspaper depicting our increasing role as PBL in the forming policy debate and policy measures with regard to the lived environment. And at the right top, you see us receiving the so-called sour milk trophy from a group of dairy farmers as a response to our critical evaluation of manure policies. I come to my last slide. Next, please. 
Now, in this context, of course, also PBL has a share of contested experiences, as I told you. So where does this lead us to? How can we build on those experiences and coming to grips with the changing knowledge environment? How can we improve the science policy interaction? How to overcome the meetings of misunderstandings? Five suggestions here. First, there is no knowledge out of nowhere. Context is everything. In presenting modeling work, it, has not, it is not enough to be saying that this is proven science. We have to explain much more clearly how that science works, where our findings come from, what explicit and implicit assumptions are underlying the work, how this is built on the shoulders of generations of scientists, how the knowledge circulates through time and space, which uncertainties are involved and what we can and cannot do with the findings. Following Bruno Latour in depicting scientific work as collaborative work, as practice, not treating it as a self-evident authority. Second, in being contextual, we as scientists have to acknowledge our modesty. We have to acknowledge the fact that societies have choices and that politics is there to discuss and balance trade-offs, such as between the quality of the environment and people's well-being, or between, between fighting climate change and or perceived preserving the landscape, between short-term and long-term interests. Deliberation is key. We have to inform deliberation, not freeze it or cage it. Third, as part of this, invest in the understanding of science work, in promoting data and modeling wisdom. Take the policy environment with you in the way in which the knowledge is produced. Turn them into co-responsible actors for the knowledge policy environment created. We have had some good experiences here in the way in which our knowledge was acknowledged as the base for the 2080 Dutch climate policy negotiations by all the negotiating partners concerned, thus creating something of a shared public knowledge environment. This is not by definition interfering with your independence. Being independent is not the same as staying at a distance. When managed thoroughly, participation in politics can go together with independence and at the same time increase your impact. Hence, strive for transparency, traceability, trustworthiness and meaningfulness. In conclusion, treat the science policy interface as an ongoing collective responsibility, both from the perspective of science work as well as from the perspective of politics. In order for the policy conversation to be about what is really at stake and not to fall into all kinds of distracting side conversations.